Well, good morning, everyone. It is so good to be here with you, and I especially feel privileged and honored to be here for Ginger's 10-year anniversary. Um, you all know how much she's meant to me, and yeah, I flew in yesterday morning at 5.15 a.m., so if my eyes seem a little droopy and my sentences don't make sense, you know why. Um, <laughs> but this was like, I wouldn't miss this occasion for anything, and so... Um, you know, thanks to Lori, she's like, no, you have to preach. So, um, <laughs> and also we thank Ginger because um, she worked hard on a sermon, and so you all will get to hear that probably next week. So, <laughs> I also, and I think we can all agree that we're here, you know, to celebrate Ginger as our pastor for the last 10 years, but also Dean. Um, how much has, De yes. I remember Bob Harrison saying to me a while back, we really get a two-for-one deal here. And, uh, <laughs> and it is true. And just how much, uh, I realized this more after I left, how much Dean's presence means to, our, to this church and also just how much he supports Ginger. So um, when I think about my time working with Ginger, there's like so many stories that I can tell. Um, the one that's coming, the one that I put together for this morning has to do with a workout contest that we had. Now, maybe the congregation doesn't know about it, but when we used to have weekly meetings, one of the things we did is we had this plastic bottle, and whoever worked out for 30 minutes would write their name and put it inside that plastic bottle. And then at the end of the week, we would count to see who worked out the most, and the winner would win a cruise. Um, <laughs> But you know what? We decided just bragging rights would be enough. So it ended up becoming bragging rights. That's right, the Dairy Queen. And it was awesome because it first began as, hey, let's all be healthier. Let's work out more. And then it turned into a fierce competition. <laughs> That's right. It was Andrew Min and Sandy and myself and Ginger and you know, you had to basically work out and for 30 minutes, and then you can put something in the bottle. Well, I remember one time someone had more than seven days of working out in one week. <laughs> or the other time when they said, you know, walking to your mailbox doesn't count as exercising for the day. And so um, working with Ginger has just been full of so much humorous times and uh, so many special moments. And I also, when I think about my time with Ginger, I also think of the risks that Ginger has taken. Um, throughout her time here at First Pres Duncanville, Dub mentioned it in the beginning. So many of us find ourselves doing things we wouldn't normally be doing. And when I think of Ginger's time here, I think of the Festival of Hope. I think of all the community outreach. I think of how these services have transformed. I think of um, so many, even with technology. When I came here, obviously I got my undergraduate in technology, and Ginger's always like, we need live streaming. We've got to have good audio, good video. Uh, what can we do to our website, our social media? Ginger does not hold back. Um, she takes risks in all sorts of directions. I mean, what pastor do you know of would think about getting a drone pilot to show up to our Festival of Hope or our community outreach? Pastors simply are not thinking about these things. And so to be able to work for Ginger has been one of the hugest highlights of my careers. Now, there is one risk that Ginger took that I thought, uh-oh, we're going to be in trouble for this one. One of the biggest risks I saw, and I think when I tell you it, you'll have the image in your head, but it was one where I thought, uh-oh, well, like, what's going to happen here? And I, I have this vision in my head of Anna Murphy standing on the roof for our, <laughs> for our Christmas carol event saying, behold, the angel of the Lord is here, and the wind is blowing, and we're all thinking, behold, I hope she doesn't fall down. <laughs> <You know? laughs> And it was cold, and Anna Murphy was our angel. So that's one of the characteristics of Ginger's leadership, just pushing forward, taking risks. And I think that we can all agree those risks have made our lives significantly better. Um, 
And again, I am going to actually preach a sermon today. It's John chapter 6, verses 20 uh, through 40, 22 through 40. And I said to Lori, how about if we just have all the people that have worked for Ginger come up and work with Ginger and just say a few nice words. And Lori, of course, said, no, you need to prepare a sermon. <laughs> so, so what I want to do in our sermon is John chapter 6, verse 20 through 40, is I want to highlight what Jesus is doing in the text and correlate that to the leadership traits I've seen in Ginger. Now, I was hanging out with a friend last night, and I told him about how I was going to be talking about the way that Ginger has led and how it corresponds with how Jesus carried himself in some of Jesus' actions. And he said, well, aren't you putting her on a pedestal? And isn't that a lot to say about someone that they lead like Jesus? And actually, I said, no, that's what Jesus told us to do. You know, Jesus says... Um, that we are going to do greater works than he has done. And so we, as a community, have done and, uh, greater works with the things like the Festival of Hope and the, all of the singing and all of the music and all of the storytelling and all of the life stuff that we're doing. So along with that has been Ginger's leadership and what she has brought to this church. And so let's go ahead and read through the passage. I did not have a PowerPoint, so we're going to be doing it the old-fashioned way, and I will be reading scriptures and then talking about them. So in John chapter 6, verse 22, it begins, this is right after Jesus has uh, fed the, the crowds, and he, this is right after he has walked on water, and he's done these amazing miracles, and there's crowds and crowds of people who are coming after him to hear him speak and to touch him and to be close to him. And in verse 22, it opens with this. This is after all of that work. It says, The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been there and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples, but that he had gone away alone. Jesus, while he was in the thick of his ministry, while he's in the thick of doing all these amazing things, gets on a boat and he goes away alone. One of the things that Jesus knew how to do better than anybody was manage himself. He knew when he needed a break. He knew when he needed to get away. He knew when he needed to turn things up because he's doing all kinds of stuff and then get away and hit the reset button. And one of the things I've seen with Ginger's leadership over the last 10 years here is Ginger knows how to manage herself. I've never seen Ginger go too high or go too low. She is the, a consistent leader, um, and she has a motor. I remember, like, she manuscripts every one of her sermons that come out every week. And she lo absolutely loves what she does here. Just such a hard worker, great attitude. Right? I, I've, I, when I worked with Ginger closely, like, she always had a positive attitude. She's always looking forward, not too high, not too low. And so she knew how to manage herself. How many of us work with people who don't know how to manage themselves? And so when they show up to work, we automatically know like, oh no, they woke up, Charlie's got his hand up real high and he's pointing, and he's pointing to Lori. So, um, <laughs> but we all have those people we've had to work with who just simply didn't come prepared or were, were extending themselves beyond what they could extend. And then we have those people who knew how to manage themselves. And that's one of the things I've learned so much from Ginger is she knows when to take a break. She knows when to take time for herself and refresh and come back. And she's always excited about the work that we do here. Do you know how many pastors struggle with that? How many pastors struggle with taking time to refresh themselves? They're so into the church, work of the church that actually they hold the church back because they didn't take the time to recalibrate. And so I think that's one of the ways we get all kinds of new amazing ideas here year after year after year of like what is going, what's going to happen this year because Ginger takes the time to refresh herself and to do the things that she can do to, to follow in Jesus' footsteps who when he led, he said, you know what, I'm going to go on a boat alone. Get away from everyone. And so in this passage, he gets away. And then in verse 23, it says, Then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Once the crowds realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, 
they got into the boats and they went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. And when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus gives them this stark response. I tell you the truth. You are looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what, what, what must we do to do the works God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Ginger's actions over a 10-year period have always been about building God's kingdom. And what we see in this passage is people are so excited about what Jesus is doing, and they want to eat more food because they're hungry or whatever, and they go out and they search for Jesus, and what Jesus does is he gets to the motivation. He says to them, you're not here because of the bigger thing that's happening. You're here because you're focused on getting more food or these miracles. And when I think about all of the things that have happened at this church over the last 10 years, I think about how they've been rooted and based in growing God's kingdom. How this church has been doing the ongoing work of loving its neighbors, of reaching out to those who are oppressed, of reaching out to those who don't know Christ and sharing Christ, of, holding, of, of keeping the doors wide open for more and more people to know Christ. People from all different walks and backgrounds. You see, for these folks in the first century that saw these miracles that Jesus was doing, they got super excited about what they were seeing, the food and the miracles and all that. And Jesus wanted to make sure that they didn't miss the deeper motivation. You see, it's when you have the right deeper motivation that all the things that you do, all of the work that you do, all the effort that you put forward, it comes from this beautiful place. And that's what we see with Christ, is that he wanted to make his Father's love known to the world. And I think that's what we see here at First Pres Church Duncanville. I remember there was these three girls who um, we would pick up from, from the part of town that a lot of people might stay away from, and we would bring them here on a regular basis. And I have to tell you, you know, Sharon Ingram, for example, she knows where all these different kids live. And Sharon is, you know, all about that. But then there's Ginger who pushes all of that, who, who's behind us, who's supporting, who's looking out for those kids. And that's, to me, been one of the most amazing things about her ministry here. Um, I remember, you know, that was a point of emphasis. Hey, We've got to figure out a way. If these kids want to be here, we've got to figure out a way to bring them here. See, the motivation is in the right place. It's about love. It's about service. It's about giving your life to something bigger than yourself. And you feel that when you're here during the services. Even this morning as we've been singing through these songs, I'm reminded of how there's a bigger thing happening here. We're here to truly worship God. Jesus says, don't work for food that spoils. And I'm reminded of the opportunities that so many of us who have worked with Ginger and the elders and the leadership here have been given to work for food that does not spoil. Because as we will find out at some point, when life is over, are we going to be concerned that our bank accounts didn't have enough money in them? Are we going to be when life is getting close to ending, are we going to be thinking about, I wish I would have just punched in the time clock for a few more hours? No, I think what we're going to remember and what we often think about in different moments of our life is those opportunities of service. Those opportunities when we got to help someone. We got to step outside of our comfort zone and give in a way that we wouldn't be able to give. I mean, isn't that exciting? I think about all those times where um, 
we, we got to do things in the community. We got to help one another out. We had to build stuff, do storytelling, sing songs, put together flyers, go put them on people's doors, give people rides, go out for a meal, cook, do a potluck. I mean, to me, f- forget about everything else. That's what life is about. Being able to be in community with one another and serve one another. And thankfully, we've had a pastor here over the last 10 years that has says, how could we do that here? What do we need to do? And yes, there's times where it's painful. There's times where it's a lot of work. But you know, that pain is what makes the joy of it that much better. You know, C.S. Lewis said, the pain now is part of the joy then. And so that's what I sense has happened here. There's been times where we've extended as far as we could and we've been tired and then we celebrate. And there's just so much ministry. I feel like if I were to go through the last 10 years, this would be like a 45-minute sermon. So I've, uh, or it'd be like a two-hour sermon, and I've boiled it down to just an hour and a half. So, um, but again, I can't um, underemphasize, I can't overemphasize just Ginger's sole focus on building God's kingdom. And then that motivation This isn't about Ginger. It isn't about you. It isn't about me. It's about God's kingdom. Isn't that exciting? And that's what Jesus' sole focus was. He says, you came here for food. There's something bigger happening. Which food is important. It's a part of God's kingdom, as we're going to have a potluck after, right? Yes. (laughs) Uh, Let's keep reading chapter 6, verse 30. And this, this is another one of those leadership traits that I think is super um, impactful and powerful. They asked him, what miraculous sign then will you give us that we may see and believe in you? What will you do? Our Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And then Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. And then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and you still do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me will never drive away. I will never drive away, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but will raise them up for the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So I just want to put this aside so I can be a little more free. When I'm thinking about the Bible and the big picture of the Bible, there's this one central thing that happens. There's this nation, there's this group of people, it begins with this guy Abraham, where God makes a promise to Abraham that he's going to redeem the world through uh, Abraham's descendants, and then Abraham's descendants have kids who have other kids, and then the nation of Israel is born. We've heard of the nation of Israel. Well, these people believe God's promise, and they do everything they can to stay together to, in order to fulfill God's promise, and they actually become kind of cultish, where they're like so tightly, and they're so all about who they are as Israelites, and they're all about their laws, and they're focused in on making sure you do the right laws. And then this new thing happens in the first century. This guy, Jesus, he's a itinerant preacher, and he starts to say to people, hey, that promise that God made to Abraham, it's coming to fruition here. I am here. I'm the one that God sent. Now, what you have to understand that is that for those people in the first century, they had whole systems built around how they carry their identity. They had whole ways of being, of like who they were and how they carry. And so for Jesus to now bring the good news that he is about to fulfill God's message that was made to Abraham, this was like good news, but for some people it was bad news because it would have caused them to adjust. It would have caused them to change the way they viewed themselves. It would have caused them to change the way they view the world. 
And so what you see happening in the Gospels, and especially in this passage, is Jesus is saying to them, hey, you got manna from heaven, but that manna came from my Father. You are so connected to Moses, but there's a new Moses that's here. And that was revolutionary for those people because they were in one perspective. This is how they viewed the world, and this is how they ordered their world. And Jesus is moving them and saying, there's a new way of being human. Now, the reason why I mention that and how that correlates to Ginger's leadership here at First Pres Duncanville is because what Ginger takes very seriously is social justice. I've seen that over the last 10 years. Ginger wants to um, help all of us to not just be focused on what we're doing here. What we're doing here matters, but what we do in the community also matters. The me- the- hey, can we just clap for that for a second? <laughs> So many churches are about building their kingdom and how awesome they are. And Ginger has made it a point to say, we've got to go outside these walls. We've got to take this message to the community. And that is about moving people's awareness from, it's all about how fancy and shiny. Don't get me wrong, things can be fancy and shiny. That could be a good thing. But our motivation has to be to allow this message of God's love, of God's grace, of God's forgiveness, and God's trustworthiness. We want that message to go out into the whole world. We don't need to keep it here as a secret for ourselves. And in the same way, what was happening in the first century is the Jews, certain Jews in Israel, were so concerned about protecting Israel and protecting their leadership. And, protect, and Jesus has this message that says, Times are changing. And so that's what we gather here to celebrate. And that's why we say, God is good. And all the time, God is good. When I first started preaching here at uh, First Pres Duncanville, I would love to get into the text and like give the historical background and find the little facts and share those little facts of why someone said they walked three miles instead of two miles or whatever. And then I would chat with Ginger after the service or after the next day to get feedback. And I remember one time, Ginger, I said, I said, I really, I'm, I'm young and I'm just out of seminary and I'm nervous because I just want to give people like the Bible study side of things. I don't want to give people like, you know, this is what we need to do. This is our homework assignment. And Ginger, of course, is opposite. She brings the scriptures, she brings the word, but then she gives us actions. Action-oriented. Um, year after year, what are we doing? Because action, social justice, it means actually doing things. And so she would say to me, you need to tell people, based on what we just read in the passage, like what we ought to do, and what the applications are, and how we can apply them to our life. And so for me, that was a huge jump in my own growth as a preacher because I moved from just digging into the text to, all right, now here's how we can apply this to our life. So how could we apply Ginger's 10-year anniversary, chapter 6, 22 through 40, to our lives this week? And I've got one simple idea. You all are pastors as well. We are all pastors of different ministries, right? Some of you are school teachers. Some of you are doctors, veterinarians, mechanics, salespeople, all kinds of stuff. We all run our own little church. It doesn't meet here at First Pres Duncanville. It might meet, you know, somewhere else around here. And I want to ask, are you leading your church in a way that when your 10-year anniversary comes up, we could all celebrate? And actually, really, it's about the way Christ led. Are we following Christ in the way that we serve those people who are entrusted to us? Because we are all called to serve in God's kingdom, and we are all building God's kingdom. It may not, doesn't have to be here. What actually is, happens during a service at the very end is this, there's this blessing, right? And Pastor Ginger says, now go. And that now go means it's now go and be a pastor out there. And so I guess I want to encourage you, and I want to challenge you to ask, you know, on these three things, are you doing a good job at managing yourself? 
Are you doing a good job at saying, you know, I need to take a break? Or are you being honest that I'm not working hard enough? I haven't done enough. I've been taking too many breaks. See, I don't know the answer to that question. You know it for yourself. But what I can confirm is that when we follow Jesus' example and we do manage ourselves and we go out on a boat alone or we go out and we do the work that we need to do, it leads to greater health and wellness for ourselves and it truly brings God's loving heaven to earth. So I don't know what that looks like for you. Does it mean to, you know, to request some days off? Does it mean um, maybe doing a new exercise routine? Does it mean signing up for yoga? Does it mean um, changing your diet? Does it mean um, reading, reading the scriptures on a daily basis or praying together or getting a group of feather, friends to talk together? All of us have different areas of our life that we need to continue to look at in terms of, of managing ourselves. And then the second thing is motivation. You know, Jesus calls those people out and says, you came here for food, but there's something bigger going on. And I want to remind you and encourage you that in your ministries, in your jobs, in your life, there's something go bigger going on. Right? And that's what we talk about as Christians, that Christ is in us. That Christ came for us, he died, he was raised from the dead for us. You want to know what the most powerful force in the universe is? It's the Holy Spirit that's in you. And so that is available to you. Aside from your circumstances, aside from your financial situation, aside from your health, aside from your relationships, there's this incredible powerful force within you that you already have. You all, it's already within you. And so the motivation for us to manage ourselves and to give in our ministries is not so that we can get back because our ego needs it. No, it's because we already have it. And Ginger's probably going to hate this because we're, I'm just complimenting her, but it's true. Is Ginger walks that way. She carries herself that way. She gives because she has God's love in her who's encouraging her and I think that we all as pastors whatever realm we're in need that motivation too we don't serve others because that then gives back to us we serve others because we've been served that the king of the world came down and who was beaten on a cross and then raised from again from on the third day that's so thrilling it's so exciting it's such a different way to live life isn't it I mean, how many of us have motors? Got to get to work, got to do this, got to do that. And if we would stop in the morning and we'd say, oh, wait a second, I have all that I need. I, like we sang in our songs. Which is why it's also awesome to come to church on a Sunday morning because you get to sing together and be reminded of those things and then head back in the week and give it, give it your go. And then finally, uh, the third application I want to challenge you with is just how Jesus moved people's awareness level and said, look, this is how you saw the world. Now you, there's something else going on here. I want to ask you, are you open to God challenging you in that area? You know, sometimes God like tries to get our attention and it comes in the form of like there's some confusion and we just ignore it. Or we feel some pain and we just ignore it. Or... But actually, those are kind of God tapping on our shoulder saying, hey, there might be something else going on here. Something else for you to consider. Something else for you to give your time and life and energy to. And so I want to challenge you with that. Is there an area in your own ministry where you've become localized? Where you focus so much in one area for so long, you're missing other areas that you could be you know, growing and changing and morphing and transforming the world. So my friends, you are a pastor, and we are so blessed to have had Ginger and will have Ginger for as long as God will have us all here, and I'm enjoying life in California, so. <laughs> um, and I've been preaching a lot at different churches in California, which is a lot of fun, and I'm, I'm in the process of just 
getting engaged to one of the churches. No, not to a woman. I know that's what everybody was thinking about. Um, it's kind of like you have the money to buy the ring, but you haven't met the right person. That's my phase in the, in the, in the, in the ministry. I've been uh, call, uh, certified for a call, and <clears throat> you know people just keep hanging up the phone. So, um, no, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. <laughs> yeah. No, um, I got a question. What does the next 10 years look like? Yeah, <laughs> more ginger, but also for yourselves, you know, and I know, um, what does the next 10 years look like for you to be the kind of pastor who's consistent, who's motivated from the right place, and who's growing and moving, and by the way, I know all of that is hard, and it's like, that's a lot of pressure, it is a lot of pressure, and you know what, God's grace is there with us, and that's why we have each other as a community to grow, go on this amazing wild journey where we're awake to what's happening around us and we're trying new things and we're pushing ourselves as far as God would want us to go. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us sing together.